Why? Because if it had just happened overnight, they'll be overwhelmed. They won't understand what they're dealing with. And so he prefers to walk in incremental steps. Why does it take so long to change and grow up? There are several reasons. And he's going to give us these reasons. He says we are slow learners. That's one of the reasons it takes so long to grow us up. We often have to relearn a lesson 40 or 50 times to really get it. That is so true. And I tell you, even in the training in braids and weaves and extensions, you say to somebody, do it this way, and they don't get it right. And they look at the one I have done, and they go, but how come it's not looking like yours? And I said, but this is your first time. Do you know how long I've been doing it? So that's what it is. We need to learn this thing over and over and over and over again. Anything in life that you want to master, that you want to perfect, that you want to be great at. Yesterday I took my young son to a sports activity. Um, he's quite good at running. That's one of his gigs. And so whenever I hear anything that he's great at and people say, let's, let's help him develop it, I am excited. Because once you know you have a gift in something, you have to learn to develop that gift. And so it's not something that's going to happen overnight in seconds. I mean, we all see Usain Bolt, uh, uh, Usain Bolt on, uh, on, uh, on when he comes to Olympics. In, in less than 10 seconds, he's there. He's done it. But the hard work that happens behind the scene for Usain Bolt to continue to be the fastest runner in the world, it's immense. But we don't see that. They don't announce that to us. They don't show that to us. They don't want us to see that. And then we get it all wrong and we all say to ourselves, we want to be that. It's a good thing to, to want to be that. But we also have to pay the price of being that. Which is the hard work, the behind the scenes, the, the cries, the pains. My son is very good at football as well and most times he, he comes back from school because all these activities are all happening around the same time. And then he says to me, he comes back, especially one of his practices. It's a Friday, he has so much activity at school and then he comes and he's so tired, Mom, I don't want to do it. And I say to him, do you still want to be good at this? Because all the Ronaldos of this world, the, the rest of the superstar celebrity footballers that you know and that you love to watch do you think they just happened overnight they went through the rough times and that's what it is about life we don't want to put in any hard work but we want to get results it, that's why it's reminding us we are slow learners we need to learn to get good at whatever it is we want to do so the problem keeps recurring and we think not again. I've already learned that. And so we do something, the problem comes, and then we say, but I've done that before. We tell ourselves all the time, I've done that before, and so I'm not going to do it again. But then you're still having problem. So if we're so good, why are you still having problem? That's a big question you should ask yourself. If you're such an expert at whatever you think you are so good at, why are you still having problems? That's a big message for us. We are slow learners. We don't learn quickly. And so, anything we've learned that's not making sense, learn it again and again and again. It does not matter how many times. Because that's just the way we are. That's who we are. God knows better. The history of Israel illustrates how quickly we forget the lessons. God teaches us and how we soon revert to our old patterns of behavior. So, whenever I read the history, the story of the Israelites of how um, Moses is taking them from Egypt, Moses going through all that trouble, going to Pharaoh over and over and performing all the various miracles that God has asked him to do to prove that he is God and the Israelites were going through so much pain and so much stress in Egypt. Eventually, they went through the Red Sea and then they were off. 
guess what? They get to the wilderness and they turned against Moses. That just goes to tell us how we forget so quickly. It says, the history of Israel illustrates how quickly we forget the lessons God teaches us and how we soon revert to our old patterns of behavior. So, whenever we learn something, we don't keep it in. We forget. The Israelites forgot completely that Moses stood there and fought for them. Now they're in the wilderness, they've forgotten everything. They said to Moses, we were better off in Egypt. Why did you bring us here? They forgot all the suffering they were going through. It says we have a lot to unlearn. And this is why it takes so long for us to learn. Number one, we are very slow learners. And even when we learn, we forget. We learn, we forget. And then the next one is we, we have a lot to unlearn. So many people go to a counselor with a personal or relational problem that took years to develop. So most times, husband and wife quarreling, we're at the point of divorce, we've had enough, we're moving on. Okay, we we'll go to we we'll go to a counselor, marriage counselor. He said, please look at what's happening between me and my husband. And then what do we do? We want him to solve a problem of maybe 20, 30 years marriage in an hour. You pay him hourly rate. So you want him to solve this problem that took forever to form, but he should solve it in an hour. That's what he's saying. He said, many people go to a counselor with a personal relational problem that took years to develop and say, I need you to fix me. I've got an hour. So this man with his magic wand should just bring the two of you together and solve this problem in an hour. I get that problem here all the time. I get people who have damaged their hair for years and years and years and then they come here and in an hour of chatting with me, all the answers to their hair problem is solved. Because when I do a review on hair and I'm consulting on hair, I want to go into your history. I want to know what you eat. I, I want to know your stress life. I want to know your work life. I know want to know your family, your husband, your children. All these things add up. And then I, I asked one lady once, um, I'll need to sit with you and consult with you to understand what's going on. He said, no one's ever told me that about hair. I said, yes, that's why you've never had any, that's why your hair's never going to grow back. Because you don't want to know the root cause of this problem. You want to whitewash it. And that's what we all do. Every issue we deal with in life, we want it whitewashed. You know when they say whitewash, you get the, the white paint and just the white paint and just go over even a dark thing. You want to go over it and in seconds it's looking white and wow, I've achieved results. That's not what we are here for. It says they naively expect a quick solution to a long-standing, deep-rooted difficulty. This is a problem. This is where we are. Deep-rooted, deep-rooted issues that we've carried on all our life, we want it solved overnight. Overnight is even asking for too much. We want it solved in an hour. Since most of our problems and all of our bad habits didn't develop overnight, we didn't form them overnight. It wasn't overnight this issue started. It's unrealistic to expect them to go away immediately. So if you've never known how to do uh, braid hair before and you match here and I say to you, take your time, learn this. And you say to me, no, I should learn it in a day. You're not being realistic. Your hair's never grown. You've been having issues with hair for so long. And then you come here and I should just give you one cream and that's in your magic growth. Your hair grows back in two minutes. You're not being realistic. You're having marital issues. You and your husband have been having issues for as long as. Like I've been having issues. I've had to delve into it. To go to the root of it. And that's where we are. That's what we should be doing. That's what Solomon told us. In all things, seek understanding. In all things. Everything you're dealing with in life, first of all, understand it. Because you know what they say? 
Knowledge is power. When you know you're bigger than that thing, when you know you can withstand, when you know you can face, you can deal with, you can handle. But when you don't know something, you are like a coward. You will run for the hills the minute that little problem comes because you don't understand it. There is no pill, he's telling us. There is no pill, there is no prayer, there is no principle that will instantly undo the damage of many years. Have you got the answer now? I think this is such important message. I think this is so powerful for all of us. There is no pill on this earth. And this is where they this is where they mess around with our life. This is where they brainwash us. This is where they, they tangle with us. Because you see all these messages everywhere. Oh, do you want to make six figure? Come to this seminar. I'll give you all the secrets. Do you want your marriage to work? I know just the, the, the place to go. Do you want this? Do you want that? And you know the worst one? When you, when you start dealing with our body, you know our physical body? And I know us women. We just want to remain as young as ever. Oh yeah, that includes me. I love my look. But I don't go looking for quick fits. Because when you go to all these doctors, I know someone, and a few people I know, who are constantly under the knife. Cut, 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 because we want to create perfection. And you, we all witness what happened to Michael Jackson. The minute you start messing around with nature in the way you are not supposed to, things start to go wrong. And that's where it is. Of removal and replacement. So there is no pill, there is no prayer, there is no principle that will instantly undo the damage of many years. And as for this prayer, that's a big one for them in Nigeria. Because the whole country right now is gripped under these cowboy pastors who just want to take money from people and ride all over town with their private jets and live in so much luxury and keep pretending to people and lying to people that they have the perfect prayer that will change their life. But you're mentally messed up. You have no clue what life is about. But you carry your whole life, your own spirit. You give it to another human being to take control of it because he has a magic prayer for you that will answer everything you always wanted dealt with. That magic prayer will deal with all the temptation you deal with. That magic prayer will solve all your marital issues. It used to make me laugh like I've, I've watched, I don't know if it's I read it in the newspaper or I watch it on TV or, and, and someone will say, will come to you and say, I have all the answers to make you and your husband perfect why don't you try wearing this underwear and so they they show you this underwear to wear and they say to you that will create a magic moment for both of you and i'm thinking seriously okay now yes there are people who are so ignorant that they will take on any gullible story they tell them and they will buy it you go and buy an underwear and that will that will create that magic moment for you and your husband and, and you keep your marriage together. Really? Underwear? What about the bills? What about the issues you're dealing with? What about the, you know, the, the, the job? What about the children? What about things we need to deal with in life? No! It's a magic underwear that I will wear and then suddenly that magic moment will be created and all you and your husband will be in heaven. If you allow people to keep messing around with your head, you have to find a way to wake up. Wake up. That's where my program comes in. This is where I'm trying to support as many people as I can that are here to listen. Wake up and ask questions whenever people want to mess around with your head. And that's why I call it a new life. Because now you have to start thinking. What kind of thoughts are going through my head that allow me to take on all this gullible nonsense? Magic prayer. Years of issues that you need to solve and sort out with your God. No, 
some pastor has a magic prayer that will answer it all. The Bible calls it taking off the old self and putting on the new self. And that's why you hear some people call it born again. Take off your old self, bring your new self in. When you were given a brand new nature at the moment of convention, you still have old habits, you still have old patterns, you still have old practices that need to be removed and replaced. And so these are the things. We have times when people who, who say to us they already know how to pray before they come to learn. And so when I'm teaching them the right way of doing it, they're struggling to unlearn how they knew it before. That's what's going on here. If we don't remove the old ways of our doing things, all the new things we're trying to learn, we not, we not find a place. I mean, and the other day I read something which came to me. If you have a bag and you keep throwing things in and throwing things in and throwing things in and it gets full, you're never going to have new things come into that bag again. You have to take out the things that are in that bag out before any new thing can come in. That is the same thing with us. If we've created habits that have become who we are today, to take on new ones, we have to unlearn the old one. That's how life is. While you were given a brand new nature, I said that one. So, the next one, he says, we are afraid to humbly face the truth about ourselves. One of the big reasons we struggle to grow. We are afraid to be honest with ourselves. We are afraid to face the truth. The truth will set us free, the Bible says. But it often makes us miserable first. So most of us don't want to deal with truth. We hate telling ourselves the truth. And one thing I say to everyone that knows me is, I, maybe it's easy to, to, to tell tales to other people. But I really can't. I can't. And if you have to even tell tales to other people, never lie to yourself. Be honest with yourself. Tell yourself the truth. You know this scenario I'm dealing with, this is really how I feel about it. I feel this way about this scenario. Not, not to whitewashing. I mean, I remember, I remember um, there's an advert, I can't remember which particular brand used to bring that advert. And it says, um, you know, when we have money problems, it says we, 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 we bury it under the sand, we put it on... You know, you put sand over something and pretend that it's not there. And that's where we are. We, we lie to ourselves, we lie to people, and then we lie to ourselves. And when you do that, only you will wake up to reality. It says the truth, the truth will set us free, but it is meant to make us miserable first. So if you're honest, yes, we'll be miserable for a few minutes, but then that's the truth. And that's the thing that they say about truth. Truth does not change. You cannot change truth. It's, it is truth. The fear of what we might discover if we honestly face our character defects, uh, our character defects, keeps us living in the prison of denial. So the fear of what we will see when we really face ourselves now keeps us in the prison of denial. So we we we'll rather we we'll rather keep lying to ourselves and denying and pretending it's not happening than to face ourselves and tell ourselves the truth. He said, only as God is allowed to shine the light of his truth on our faults, failures and hang-ups can, can, can we begin to walk on them. Yeah? Only as God is allowed to shine the light of his truth on our faults, failures and hang-ups can we begin to walk on them. So, God can, can shine light on our faults, on our failures, and on our hang-ups. And when he does that, we can then begin to work on them. So we, we know, we know what our failures are. We know what our truths are. We know what our hang-ups are. We know what our faults are. It's for us to work on them. That's what he's telling us. We need to work on them. And that's where all that sledgehammer and chisel hammer and jackhammer comes in when he, when he hammers us with these issues. We should wake up and deal with them and face them. This is why we cannot grow without a humble, 
teachable attitude. Reading this book has been an amazing thing for me because my attitude is ready to learn. And I'm hoping that's the same with yours. He said, growth is often painful and scary. That's the next reason we don't know. It's often painful and scary. There is no growth without change. That's a really good one that I picked up on. There is no growth in life without change. Something has to change before you grow. But there is no change without fear. See how it's connecting? First, something has to change for you to grow because there's a saying that it's only the insane person, you know, a mad person that keeps repeating the same thing over and over and over and hope to see a change. So if you're taking the same action every day of your life you're not going to see something different you're going to get the same result so he says if you keep taking the same action you'll get the same result full stop the only time the result will change is if you change one action change one part of the action and you get a different result but it's only a madman who repeats that same action every day and expect a different result so now he's explaining to us there is no growth without change so you cannot you cannot get a different result without changing something is this making sense because it is making to me you cannot get a different result without changing something but there's also this fear among us we're scared of change and so he says there is no change without fear so we're always afraid of changing something of loss without fear of loss so the minute you you are you're thinking let me change something you think oh but I might lose something in the process of changing something and it says but there is no loss without pain so every time you lose something you feel a part of you something has gone and this happens with everyday life as well you may just be looking for where you kept your key or where you kept your phone or where you kept your eyebrow pencil or you know something as ridiculous as that your earrings where did i keep it you suddenly feel a loss of some kind that's a big message for us every change no matter how trivial involves a loss of some kind but you must let go of the old ways in order to experience a new way remember i gave the example of the bag that you're putting things in and then you want you want to add more and there's no more room in the bag you have to bring some things out take some give room you have to give room for new things to fit into that bag that's the same thing you must let go of the old ways in order to experience a new way so these are big messages for us to take on huge messages we fear these losses even if our old ways were self-defeating because like in one out pair of shoes, they were at least comfortable and familiar. So that's another, another great message for us to take on. It says, we fear losses. Even if that old way of doing things was self-defeating, it was breaking us down, we're losing, we're not making any sense to ourselves. It's not happening, but no, we still want to grip onto it. Because like an old pair of shoes, it is comfortable. You see, this, this shoe that I know is comfortable, so I'm not ready to put on a new shoe. That's where the problem is. They are comfortable and they are familiar. So that's who we are as human beings. We stick to old ways. We don't want to change old ways. We want to, no matter what's happening, we know it's not working. We know it's breaking us. We know it's destroying us, but no, let me stick to it. Let me hold on to it because it is comfortable and it's familiar. You know what they say? I think there's a saying too that says, um, oh, that saying is just this, um, not cut potato. It's like, we, we just, we just, we just stick to what we know. That's what it is. I know it, so I don't want to change it because I'm not familiarity. I'm familiar with it. So let me not look at another way of doing anything. We're always too afraid of letting go of our old ways. That's my understanding. 
we get familiar with things the way they are because we are scared of facing something new we don't want to deal with a new scenario but he says we cannot grow without starting something new without letting go of the old ways we cannot bring in new things into our life if we don't let go of our old way of doing things you know when i say uh, you can't eat your cake and have it you cannot have your old way and then have your new way all in one person it doesn't work that way you have to let go of the old way for the new one to take roots in your life so he's saying here you have to let go of the old before a new thing can happen in our lives and we have to stop being afraid of losing old things in order for new things to, to come into our lives. And I understand it as when one door closes, another door opens. Or people even say another window opens. When one door closes, another window opens. So we have to stop being afraid. We have to stop take out this fear of the known and be more excited about the unknown we should aim to to find out whatever it is I mean that's the whole point of life try new things not get so comfortable with old ways of doing things because this is why we're not growing how can you stick to the old and say you're growing you're old you know this old thing it's it's known you want unknown. You want to try something new. Get excited about it. But now some people will rather just stick to the known. I know it, so why, why should I change it? People often build their identity around their defects. We say it's just like me to be blah, blah, blah. It's just the way I am. So you hear people click their identity to that thing. But that's who I am. That's the way I am. The unconscious worry is that if I let go of my habit, my heart, or my hang up, who will I be? And that's the unconscious way of thinking about it. If I don't stick to this one that I know, who am I going to become then? And so we cling on, and cling on, and cling on, and that's why we're not growing. This fear can definitely slow down our growth. And that's what's happening. We cannot grow holding on to the old. That's a big message here. You have to let go of the old and then welcome the new. And then experience something different. And then grow. Become a new person. And then the next reason it says habits take long to develop. Remember our character is the sum total of our habits. So this person that we are now is the little little habits little little habits oh he always at, he goes very early um he's he's always on time to an event so that's a habit oh he must give you an answer right away that's a habit um he never he never tells you the truth that's a habit you know so every little little thing that you take on all add up to create what they call your character oh i know her character she's like that she's like this she's like this she's like this so it's all those habits that add together to create this character but you cannot claim to be kind unless you are habitually kind so he's trying to explain to us now what we are thinking in ourselves you cannot tell people you're a kind person if you unless you are habitually kind like you're kind all the time you show kindness without even thinking about it it's just nature it just flows through you that's kindness you cannot claim to have integrity unless it is your habit to always be honest so you can't tell anybody oh i have integrity but you're never honest a husband who is faithful to his wife most of the time is not faithful at all you cannot tell yourself i'm a very faithful husband but meanwhile, it's not all the time. Your habits define your character. That's what he's saying. Your habits become a total of who your character is. There is only one way to develop the habits of Christ-like character. And you must practice them. And that takes time. There are no instant habits. Paul urged Timothy, practice these things 
devote your life to them so that everyone can see your progress. So whatever habits you want to take on, you have to practice them. And you have to devote your life to them. If you practice something over time, you get good at it. I should be a good one to say that one because that's what I teach every day in our braiding or hair care industry. If you don't practice creating cornrows, how can you be good at cornrows? If you don't practice doing single box braids, how can you be good at that? If you don't practice uh, doing twists, how can you be good at twists? If you don't practice doing weaves, how can you tell yourself you know how to weave? So the same thing applies to every habit that we form in life. You have to practice it. Repetition is the mother of character and skill. He said, mother of skill. Skill being all these things that we do with our hands, just like football, just like athletics, just like singing. If you don't practice, just like cooking, just like sewing, just like makeup. It's something you practice over time. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't have to be the first time you do it, you, you expect perfection. Just like anything in life, skill of braiding, cooking, public speaking, beauty, sewing, makeup, everything in life needs practice. Driving. These character building habits are often called spiritual disciplines. That's what he calls them. They're called spiritual disciplines. And this, and there are dozens of great books that can teach you how to do this, he said. He says, don't get in a hurry when you want to start this. As we grow to spiritual maturity, there are several ways to cooperate with God in the process. Believe God is working in our life even when we don't feel it. We should remember that. Even when we don't physically feel it. And that was a good one for me because there are times I still wonder, oh my goodness, but, but where? How? And then I, I just took my time to think about it this morning and I was like, I missed. You hear it. It says spiritual growth is sometimes tedious work. One, stop, one small step at a time. Expect gradual improvements. The Bible says everything on earth has its own time and its own season. That's a really good one too. There are seasons in our spiritual life too. Sometimes we have a short, intense burst of growth. He calls that springtime. Followed by a period of stabilizing and testing. He calls that the fall and the winter. So that's how we're growing now. What about those problems, habits, and hurts you would like miraculously removed? That's a question he's asking us. It's fine to pray for a miracle, but don't be disappointed if the answer comes through a gradual change. And so God works. He's doing something for us. It's like hair. I tell people all the time, your hair is growing constantly. Because I have dealt deeper into understanding from the roots of the hair how the hair strands are being fed by the food we eat. And that's why when people come here to consult with me over hair growth, I take them through the inside first. It's the food you eat that feeds the bloodstreams. And it's the, from the bloodstream, the, the hair roots get fed from there. And so as far as hair history or hair cycle is concerned, your hair is growing. But you don't see it. It will not be in your face. Look at my growth. You will not see that happening. But it is growing. So that's what he's telling us. God is working for us. But we don't feel, sometimes we don't see it. It's only once in a while when something boom happens. Go, oh my goodness, did you see that miracle? But just being alive, God is there with you. Over time, a slow, steady stream of water will erode the hardest rock and turn giant boulders into pebbles. So no matter how slow dropping this water is, over time, it will create 
it will turn this hard rock into pebbles. This big problem that we think we have over time, God makes us realize it's not as tough as we thought it was. Over time, a little sprout can turn into a giant redwood tree towering 350 feet tall. A tiny little sprout. Over time, it becomes that. But remember what he told us. We're in this era where speed is of essence at all times for all of us. We want the answer now. And that's not how God works. God works in us whether we believe it or not. He is working even when we don't feel it. He's advising us to keep a notebook or journal of, our, of the lessons that we learn in life. So this is not a diary of events, but a record of what you are learning. So every time something happens, every time you have a disappointment, some major bad thing happens, you should watch out. There's always, they call it a silver lining. There's always something great underneath it. I mean, if I didn't have all these negatives that I had recently, I would not have been reading this book. And I keep telling everyone that. Because I would have been so happy, things would have been perfect for me. I'm like, what do I need this for? There's a chapter where he reminded us clearly. He says it's only when things are really tough that we remember to pray real prayer to God. Because when things are okay, we just all superficially, oh God, thank you God, you've done me great today, I feel good. But when things are really tough, our heart opens up. So behind all those things that we think it's such a nightmare, there is always something greater coming from it. So this is not, it says write on the insights and life lessons God teaches you about him, about yourself, about life, about relationships, and, and about everything else. We should write it down. We should note them. And there's a reason. Record this so you can review and remember them and pass them on to the next generation. So that's such a good thing because look at the great work he did. He wrote this. Now he's helped me. And I'm sure he's helping all the rest of us who are listening and buying this book and reading. And so the, the role now is to us to also start noting all the experiences we are having and things we're dealing with. So we can share it with our children as well. So we can share it with our friends. So we can share it to the next generation. Because this is how amazing life is. It is life. We must go through it all. All of us must experience these things happening. It may not be in the exact same words, but when you look back, your mom went through a similar thing. Your sister went through a similar thing. Your brother went through. So you're wondering, how do we help? How can we help people understand that life? It's not just this amazing thing that you just run into. The reason we must relearn lessons is that we forget them. Remember when he told us clearly that we forget things so easily? We must keep learning. We must never stop learning. And that's why we have the Bible. We have to keep reading it to, to, to feed us. Feed our spirit every day. Because it's so easy to forget. The Bible says it is crucial that we keep a firm grip on what we've heard. Reviewing your spiritual journal regularly can spare us a lot of unnecessary pain and headache. Heartache. And then the next one I was reading was, Bible says it is crucial that we keep a firm grip on what we've heard so that we don't drift off. And the next one he says, we should be patient with God and ourselves. And I know, just like he said about speed, this is one thing most of us struggle with, including myself. We are extremely impatient. But it says we have to be. One of life's frustration is that God, God timetable is rarely the same as ours. Because as far as we are concerned, as human beings, this is how we guide our life. By the age of 11, I'll get to um, secondary school. And by the age of 17, I should be university. And by the age of 22, I should be married. And by the age of 25, I should have children. And by the age of... And so we've already told ourselves, and by the age of 30, I should have 50 houses. And by the age of 40, by the age of 50, 
We've already lined it out in our head and we already know what we should be doing. And that's not God's timetable. That's your timetable. You chose that timetable. And this is why there was somewhere I read and it says most times by the age of 25, we've given up on life. He said most of us at the age of 25, we're just dead walking. We're just a, a walking dead. So we, we walk around, we do things, but we're already dead. Why? Because all the exciting dreams we had as kids has disappeared. Why? Because it's not what we thought it was going to be. It's not happening the way we thought in our head. And so now we've given up. And that's why you hear depression. That's why you hear suicide. That's why you hear people are mentally ill. Because we've taken on so much and we're not prepared to give it time to grow. It's so important. We have to keep learning every day. Never give up. Never say you've learned enough. I know so many people have said, you know what, I used to read when I was young. I don't read anymore. What do I care about reading? But how are you going to grow spiritually if you don't read? How are you going to ever have new things in your life if you think the ones you read when you were young is all you need to grow in this same lifetime? When you were young, is different. It's like I tell my son all the time, he looks at all these amazing um, designer brands and he's like, I want to have that one, I want to I say, son, by the time you grow up, there will be different brands. You will not even remember these brands. And that's what it is. So the books you read when you were young, is not the same books you're reading now. And so when you were young, before the age of 25, when you created this imaginary life that never happened, you should not stop you and say, you know what, I've lived it. It's no more. I'm not interested anymore. Now, you remember that passage? When I was young, I thought like a child. But now that I'm old, I should think like a man. That's what we should do. We should learn to grow with time. We grow with the seasons. We grow with time. We mature as we go along. He said, we, we are often in a hurry when God isn't. God isn't in a hurry. And we may feel frustrated with the seemingly slow progress we are making in life. Yeah, I tell you, if I, oh my goodness, my life is done. We, may, we are feeling frustrated. Yes, that's us. We are feeling that way. But God is not feeling that way. Remember that God is never in a hurry, but He is always on time. And that's why God is the truth. God has never switched from being the truth. And that's why His word is constant. And it makes me think over and over, that Bible has been the same for centuries. Have you ever seen anybody go and change a chapter in the Bible? So, oh, by the way, this century has changed, so let's rip. Let's read uh, Acts of the Apostle, chapter 20. Boom. Let me take it out and replace it with the current. No. The Bible is the same forever. That tells us something. And I always remind myself, I say, we are the only new things on this earth. We are the new. We, we are the one who slots ourselves into the world. The world has always been there. So it's for us to grow ourselves to suit the world. He will use our entire lifetime to prepare us for our role in eternity. So God takes his time to prepare us. For reasons we don't know, but he, he, he takes his time to mature us slowly. And you know, like wine as well. If you, if, you, if you think about it, people don't buy new wine because they say, oh, it hasn't matured. They allow wine, you hear 1538, 1540. I'm like, really? They take time to mature wine. And as it gets more and more mature, that's the time to drink it. That's when it's good. So that's what it is with us. We should mature spiritually. So the Bible is filled with examples of how God uses a long process to develop character, especially in leaders. So now keep thinking as a leader. God wants to use you to lead something. God wants you to, he wants to use you to spare head something, to start a truth, to start a knowledge, to start an experience, to start something that would change other people's lives. He took 80 years to prepare Moses. And that made me think, oh my goodness, I never knew that. But we read the Bible and we don't get to know the other parts. He took 80 years to get Moses ready to go and face Pharaoh. 
Remember Moses' story. First he was brought up in Pharaoh's house and then he ran away into the wilderness and now he comes back as a leader. So all these experiences were all meant to help and prepare him to face that role of taking the Israelites out of Egypt. He took a long time to prepare him. And he spent 40 years in the wilderness. I was like, wow. But look at us, 25, we think it's over. For 14,600 days, Moses kept waiting and wondering, is it time yet? Moses was asking God that, is it time yet? But God kept saying to him, no, not yet. When I read this, I felt good. I felt good because obviously I've been through difficult times. I've been struggling with so many things and I've been asking myself, what am I really doing? And sometimes I don't even know where I'm going or where I'm coming from. Or, and I know the message is there and I know the spirit is there and I know things are happening to me. But I don't get it. I'm reading this and I'm beginning to get it. Because I know there's a lot more bigger than I can even imagine going on in my head. A bigger message. A bigger mission for me to take on. All I can say to myself is watch this space. Because I know. This is what they call maturing. And it took this long for Moses to be ready. Contrary to popular book titles, there are no easy steps to maturity or secret of instant sainthood. So contrary to what people might think out there, that oh yeah, they got it overnight. There's no shortcut to these things. God takes his time to prepare us. And when God wants to make you, this is a good analogy. He says when God wants to make a mushroom, you know a mushroom? mushroom when God wants to make a mushroom he does it overnight and that is so true because as a child growing up in Nigeria in the farm you run out in the morning maybe in the night we went to the farm and we finished and went home and there was no mushroom there and the next day we pop up in the farm and look at mushroom everywhere you know like, what where did they come from that's how God makes mushrooms he makes them overnight but when he wants to make a giant oak tree, he takes 100 years. Does this make sense to you? It makes sense to me. I'm, I was like, oh my goodness. Because when God wants to make something great, it doesn't happen overnight. That's the, that's the message here. So, now question I'm asking is, do you want to be a mushroom or do you want to be an oak tree? Because if you want to be a mushroom, yes, you can attend that seminar in two, two days, you finish, and then you go home and you ask yourself, what did I learn? You can take on a one-day workshop in braiding, and you go home and you tell yourself, oh yeah, I know how to braid now, and I'm ready to attend to every client that walks through my door. Because I sit here and I attend to clients, and I know the requirements clients have. And when you want to train here, I guide you on how to prepare you for them. But no, I get people who don't want to know that. They just, all I want is just give me the, the action of braiding and I'm done. So that's you, a mushroom then. Overnight, you are fixed. But if you want to become an oak tree, there's no end. There is no end to how you continue to learn. You learn continuously. It says an oak tree takes 100 years to make. Great souls are grown through struggles and storms and seasons of suffering. So that explains it. Great spirits, great souls, people who can deal with, who can relate to experiences, who can handle issues. The only way you can do that is through struggle, through experiences, through Storms. So if you have not experienced it, how can you talk about it? How can you talk about what you don't know? That's the message. And so you have to experience it. And that's what God did with Moses by preparing him for all the scenarios he was going to deal with. Because if he had not experienced it, when he tries to talk about it, people say, yeah, and who are you to talk about it? 
But when they know you've been through it, then you can relate to it. Then you talk about it. I've been in this country now 23, 24 years, and I can talk about my experiences here. That's what this is about. I've had children, and I can talk about having children and raising them and the experiences of dealing with them. I've been married, I'm married, and I know what it's like to be married. Dealing with infidelity, dealing with uh, um, um, the heartbreaks that that brings, I can relate to all of that now. I run a business and I know what it feels like to run a business. I struggled with money, I know what it feels like. I struggle with, with losing a job, I know what it feels like. So do you see how you are being prepared slowly and slowly and slowly? So that by the time you talk, and I remember one of the one of the churches I used to go to, and the pastor used, used to say, let your experience be your, your ministry. Let your experience be your ministry. That's what this is about. Moses' experience became his ministry. Because now he could talk to the Israelites, he could talk to Pharaoh, he could talk to anybody, and they can relate with what he was talking about. Because he knew he had experienced what he was talking about. And so if you want to hide away from problems, you're trying to cut short this journey that God wants to take you through. And, and, and he explains it. Be patient with the process. We should be patient with the process. This process of taking you through difficult times. Be patient with them. James advice. Don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Do you see that? Don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Because when you try to cut short, now, on the spot, let it do its work so you become mature and well. You become mature and well developed. So once you try to cut short, you cut away that experience. And and for most of us women, I know, I, I may not be an expert at saying this one, but I know that most times when marital problems arise, we run for the hills. We run. And that's why you hear three times divorce, seven times like, Elizabeth Taylor, yeah, seven times. I never married one twice, eight times. Because we don't want to mature. And it's not just women, men are like that too. You have some men, they married three, twelve, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. And they're still married and still married. And they see the next girl, they fall in lust again because it's never love, it's lost. And so in their head, they just think, oh yeah, it's her body, it's her body. And you don't want to know about the person's character. You don't know if you can deal with this person. You don't know that the minute you get into the house and lock the door, the issues that happens behind the door becomes what you have to deal with. And if you could not deal with number one, you could not deal with number two, how can you deal with number three? So these are the issues about life. We want to cut short the process. That's what he's telling us. We should not cut short the process. We should allow the process to happen because it helps to mature us and make us well developed. And so the last part is don't get discouraged. That's the last part. He says, when Habakkuk became depressed because he didn't think God was acting quickly enough, God had this to say to him. These things I plan won't happen right away Slowly, steadily, surely the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair for these things will surely come to pass. So if our life seems slow, we shouldn't despair. Because these things will surely come to pass. He says God is always on time. When he said he was going to, he is going to do something, he do it exactly when he says he would do it. It will not happen according to our time. It will not happen at 25. It might be at 80. When Moses was prepared fully. When he had gone through the experiences 
the storms, the heartaches, the pains, the struggles. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. God is on time. A delay is not a denial from God. Just because it's not happening when we want it doesn't mean God has denied us that. Remember how far you've come, not just how far you have to go. Remember all the things you've been through. Not just what you're thinking to achieve, but the things you've been through. You are not where you want to be, but neither are you where you used to be. That was a great one for me. I loved it. He says you're not where you want to be. But neither are you where you used to be. Have we thought about that? And that's when I realized, oh my goodness, you know, you're so right. Because I kept thinking, oh my goodness, all this stress, all this pain, nothing working the way I want it, it's not happening. And just a simple statement. You are not where you want to be yet. Yes, you're not there yet. But neither are you where you used to be. So look back. Are you still where you used to be? So that shows you how something is happening. It may not be the way you want it to happen. Years ago, people wore a popular button with the letters P, B, P, G, I, N, F, W, M, Y. He said that letter stood for Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. So that's what we probably should be writing. We should do a t-shirt and just put that on. Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Because there's still a lot coming my way. And I'm sure there's a lot coming your way too. There's a lot happening that we're not aware of. And it's for us to understand that God has his own time and it's not our time. And it's about us not giving up. It's about us realizing that life has so much to offer us if we can open to open up to God and say, lead us the way you want us to go. God isn't finished with you either. So keep on moving forward. Even the snail, you know the snail, that animal that's just oh, if they tell you the folk tales about snails he never gets anywhere in time you always get carried by other people he just he just goes like that snail is the slowest animal ever but it says even the snail reaches the, reached the ark by persevering remember the ark with noah when noah had to put all the animals in the ark even the snail got there so that tells you something by persevering so we need to learn to persevere we need to learn to understand the way god works we need to learn to look into ourselves and start picking up on all these messages that we've been clearly given how we're in such a hurry how we don't learn properly how we don't pick up on you know things that are happening to us we don't want to pick up the signs how we are so afraid of change and we don't want to take on any new thing we get so comfortable sitting on the one couch all of these habits are the things that are stopping us from growing and so this is the end of this chapter and i have been so intrigued by it i have i have picked up so much by it as usual, before we go, we we'll quickly look at the messages. It says, a point to ponder, it says, there are no shortcuts to maturity. And so that's a big thing we have to pick up from this chapter. There are no shortcuts to maturity. And the meditation is, God began doing a good work in you, and I am sure he will continue it until it is finished. When Jesus Christ comes again. So... Let's say we're not thinking that far to eternity when Jesus comes. But God started a, a good thing in you on this earth. Until he's finished, he's not finished. 
And that's why I know some of us will ask ourselves. I was chatting with one of my friends the other day and we were saying, all our relatives, most of our relatives have gone and we still see ourselves here, we're one in Jesus. What made me so special that I'm still here? That's because there are some messages we've been sent to do that we haven't done. So he began a good thing in you, he began a good thing in me. So it's for us to just carry on doing it. And the question is, in what area of my spiritual growth do I need to be more patient and more persistent? Just like the snail, slowly, 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 who we'll can there? Patient. Not rush, not go crazy. But pick up on all the lessons we've been given, all the talks we've been told, and all the amazing things we now know. So, thank you so much for watching. And please remember to share this message to as many of your friends as possible. This is such a great message coming across to all of us. And I am so happy that I chose to share this with you. Um, so remember to subscribe. The book is still here. We still haven't finished. It's a 40-day plan. And I really look forward to how we're going to end up by the time we finish this book. I mean, for me personally, it's going to be one of those books that's just by my side because you know what he said, we have to keep learning. We should never say we've learned enough because even after we've learned, we we'll go back, we we'll go, oh, but I learned that one. Why is that happening again? Then we realized, ah, we didn't get the message well that first time. So that's why we decided to record this because I want it to be there even for myself and for my children and for generations to come. Let's just keep listening to these things and it will help to make our life better. So, thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter. And God bless you abundantly.